Welcome to the Guns and Gavel Show, where Arizona's self-defense and firearms attorney, Tim Forshee, weighs in on the delicate balance between the law and personal protection. Learn about the legalities and realities of self-defense as he dives deep to discuss firearms laws, legal use of force, concealed carry, and home defense training. The Guns and Gavel Show starts in 3, 2, 1. Hi folks, Tim Forshee. We're back today with my good friend, John Correa from Active Self Protection, uh, the absolute expert on all things gun related. Uh, ooh, ooh. I just don't know of anybody that has their finger on the pulse of, uh, of, of firearms uh, issues better than John. I really don't. So we wanted to have him here today. Uh, got some hot topics going on this week, John, this week and last week with regard <sighs> to some horrific shootings around the country, one in upstate New York, one in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Uh, all these are getting a lot of publicity, as they should, I think, as, as I they agree. should. I, I don't normally uh, side with the media on a lot of this stuff, but th- this stuff needs to be talked about. It needs to be discussed. I think I we need to make sure, though, that the discussion is going the right direction. And so I thought I'd bring you in and see what your thoughts were on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, both of those instances, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, one, uh, you know, kids driving up a driveway and, and turning around and trying to leave and end up getting shot through the car, uh, that led to murder charges. This, you know? this hits home for me because I grew up in a really rural area. Right. And we, before there was any such thing as MapQuest. I mean, if you, if you were lucky, you might have a road map. <laughs> Look how old he is, MapQuest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you bastard, shut up. <laughs> the, the point is, though, is that I, I, if I could count on, on, on 5,000 hands the number of times I drove to a farmhouse and, and knocked on a door to ask for directions sure. I and mean, that kind of thing. I mean, so this really rings true for me. Is that, that's a perfectly acceptable uh, mistake to make, if you will. Yeah. How and, innocent. And know. then the second one, a, a young man just going to pick up his yeah. his younger siblings yeah. and gets shot through the door right. uh, with with no provocation um, and murder charges there, right. you know, and, and should be. And, you know, I, I recently saw, I forget what which one of the major media publications talked about that. Well, it's really casting light on stand your ground. That's my whole point. That's why I wanted to have you here. I and, think that's ridiculous. I mean, the first thing is, is neither of these have a darn thing to do with right. stand your ground. Right. Um, I, I recently taught at a national conference, and at every seminar I taught, somebody asked, John, could you explain Stand Your yeah. Ground? And, and I always say from a practical perspective, uh, when I teach private citizens self-defense, I, I want you for all practical purposes to ignore any doctrine of Stand Your Ground. Yeah. If you can retreat with success without any risk to yourself, without any danger, you're a fool if you don't. I don't get to tell that to clients because by the time somebody's a client of mine, it's way too late to right. tell them. Right, we've that. already gone but through But I all do that. about four or five classes every every yeah. month, and uh, I it, same thing. I get the same question every single class. What about the stand your ground thing, you know? And I say the same thing, ignore it. it I always say this, and, and perhaps this is fair, perhaps it's unfair, I think it's fair. I think it's a media-driven concept. I think that it, it does exist, but the point I always tell people is, I don't care if you're walking backwards or forwards, uh, you can only use lethal force if you're literally in fear for a human life, period. So and and you are reasonably in fear. Correct. Well, I, obviously it must be reasonable. Right. Yeah. So, so that's for a jury to decide inevitably. But yes, I, I, and clearly somebody coming up and ringing your doorbell, I mean, come on. There's just no reasonable fear there. Well, and, and in particular, the, that, that one in Kansas City, yeah. uh, it sure looks like there's a racial component there. And you, and you hate to say that because I think our nation's at a really bad point with regard to race relations, so we hate to throw gas on the fire. But I think and, you're right. And I, I think that's an un- inescapable conclusion there. Yeah. yeah, it seems like, you know, in that case in particular. Yeah. Now, again, I'm not saying, and I wouldn't say, you know, every time you see somebody who's white shoot somebody who's black, that doesn't mean it's racially Absolutely motivated. Absolutely not. And three, uh, it's mean when that's the inference, right? But yeah. sometimes it is. Sure, sometimes it is. It and it seems the evidence that at least is coming out in the press right now seems that there's that component. And so, I mean, of course, if that's any part of that, that's deplorable. I mean, it's, it's horrific. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll be the one that turns the key on his jail cell. Yeah. But, but I, I like you. And whenever we see a, a shooting like what we saw in Kenosha or what we saw in, in Missouri many years ago with the Brown shooting, just because the parties are different races doesn't mean it's a racially motivated shooting. No. And unless there's some evidence that it was, then let's not talk about that part of it. You know? So, so... Obviously, the one in New York wasn't racially motivated, or at least there's really no evidence that it was. And, you know, the guy that shot that white, the victim is white. Mm-hmm. So, OK, fine. We don't have that. But but the big problem, my first problem that I see is somebody knocks on your door. At, let's talk about Kansas City. That's the knock on the door yeah. is he knocks on the door and you shoot him through the door. Right. I mean, you have a barrier between you mm-hmm. and you have somebody standing on your porch who simply knocked on the door. And in this case, simply knocked on the door because he had gone to the wrong house. He thought he was at the right place. He thought he yeah. was at the right place to pick his siblings yeah. up. And it was like, a, instead of a, like a, a, I forget, it's like a thoroughfare instead of a street or something, mm-hmm. or a terrace instead of a street. Uh, and so he's just in the wrong, at the wrong place. And 
uh, that's an earnest mistake. And so, right. listen, if you want to challenge through your door, I wouldn't recommend necessarily opening your door to an unknown right. person. But it, it was apparently there was glass on the door and a challenge. What are you doing? You know, get off my property, whatever. Right. If you're a curmudgeon and you don't want to answer the door, you know, I mean, I want the Girl Scouts to come with the cookies, sure. so please knock on the door. Otherwise, I already know Jesus. I don't want to buy your magazine subscriptions. Unless you're selling Girl Scout cookies, leave me alone. Yeah, it better be Thin Mint. Th thin Mints. Let's make sure we get that. Okay, right. so, you know, in the comments, why? what's the best Girl Scout cookie and why is it Thin Mints? Keep your coconut away from my house. That's all I'm saying. All right, so. So, I mean, and, and, but, but, you know, challenging somebody, get away from my, you know, get away from my door, leave me alone, I don't want any, whatever. I mean, just that challenge could right. have completely ended this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm here to pick up my siblings. I had an interesting day yesterday. I have, I have an elderly client that just hired me yesterday, obviously, who shall remain unnamed. And uh, she's sort of homebound, so I said, well, I'll come to your house and meet you there if you're comfortable with it. Sure. And so I wrote down her address, and for some reason I forgot to write down her phone number, which I should know better. I've been practicing law for over 30 years. You'd think I'd remember that part. So I went to her address, and there was no such address. I, I had juxtaposed two of the numbers when I wrote it on my computer. Uh, so now what do I do? So I, and it's, it's fairly far from my office. I didn't really want to just give up. So I went to the number that was closest to the number I wrote down and just rang the doorbell and waited and waited. And after about maybe two or three minutes, the door opened up, and this young lady answered the door. And I asked her the question, you know, do you know this young lady? And she said no. And so I, but I said, you know, I, I got to be honest. Thank you for opening the door. I'm yeah. surprised you opened the door. And she said, well, I looked at my ring doorbell, and you, and you looked really trustworthy. And I thought, oh, you, yeah. you, we need to educate you just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> well, trustworthy. But I, but I, I couldn't help. When I'm standing there waiting, I couldn't help but think about the young man in Kansas yeah. City. It's like, I mean, should you really be afraid to ring a doorbell these days? But I think that the, the, the national tension level, and also let's, uh, one thing I want to talk to you about, I, the, the ignorance of the person that answered the door and fired through the door. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's just, that has nothing to stand your ground. That's a complete lack of understanding of self-defense. It's a complete lacking of, of understanding of human morality, I right. would even say. I agree. Uh, and, and, and people are trying to make it, it's a, it's a law issue. If we change some laws, these tragedies will stop. If we get rid of stand your ground law, this will stop. I think we need to make sure that the conversation goes back to where it should be. The Second Amendment is an absolute right. Everybody has the right to keep their arms unless yep. they're a prohibited possessor. But that doesn't make it a good idea for a lot of people, just like owning a chainsaw. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying you have to be really, really, really skilled to own a gun, but if you don't have the basic concept of you don't shoot somebody just because they ring your doorbell, I'm not really sure maybe you should be taking this step yet. What are your thoughts on that? I, well, I love when we disagree about stuff, too. No, so no, I totally agree. I think, yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, so every state in the union has a version of castle doctrine. Mm -hmm. There's not a state in the union that doesn't. So you, you have no duty to retreat from your home mm -hmm. anywhere in the United States. If you're inside your home, that is kind of your last bastion of retreat is what the right. law has already, always seen. And that comes out of British common law. Absolutely. So this is... You know, hundreds of years. From, yeah. Not too many castles in, 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 uh, in the U.S. So we're talking hundreds of years yeah. of, of, you know, this tradition. And just so we're all on the same page, a, a woman's home is also her, her castle. Right, so, amen, yeah. right? Yeah. A okay. person's home <laughs> is their castle. A menstruating human being. Yeah, so, and so it, it's this idea that says, okay, wait a minute, so if we didn't have stand your ground, had nothing to do with it right. in this case. What it had to do with is, was there a reasonable objective evidence that a deadly threat existed? And did the, the, the uh, person who shot reasonably perceive that threat and react to that threat? So in this case, somebody rings your doorbell, the door is closed, you don't have any evidence that they're armed, that they have ill intent, you, you can't articulate that they did, and you just said, oh, I just shot him through the door because I was scared of him. Why were you scared of him? Um, and the unfortunate truth is it seems like there's some evidence that he was scared of him because he was black. And... and um, you know, and, and, and I lament in America that if you don't have this, and again, I'm not trying to inflame problems or whatever, mm -hmm. but I have friends who, you know, have said, John, you've never been pulled over and asked, do you know how black you were driving? Right, exactly. And, and I go, no, I don't know that. You know what I mean? I'm an old fat white guy. And so exactly. I get that, that privilege. Um, and I've represented people that we, we talk about DWB, and I, right. and I flat out say, I, I can't relate to that. No. I've never had to deal with what you have to deal with on a daily basis. Right. So you do have to start there and have that conversation. And, and so... What we have here is the laws that are in place are actually perfectly suited to what actually happened here. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is without any objective evidence of a deadly threat, that there actually existed a deadly threat, well then there's no justification to the use of deadly right. force, and we call that uh, murder. And, and because he said, no, I, I said, oh, wait a minute, he scared me, so I shot him, that's a, a conscious 
uh, action. Right. So we're not talking about manslaughter here. That's not recklessness no. or negligence. This is second degree it. murder. This is second degree yeah. murder. Right. And and so and I think they may even be able to enhance it to first. I had a person yesterday that said, "So you're telling me that this this 84 year old man who appears perhaps to even be somewhat senile. If you've seen the pictures of him, yeah. he appears to be in ill health. He's very hunched and, yeah, for and sure. didn't didn't have a look in his face like he knew what was going on." Which you have to factor in the fact that he's a criminal defendant. I have lots of clients that are sure. have 140 look, IQs that look, look old like and that. look frail. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. right. So, but the but the point being is that people say, really, I mean, with that guy, you're, you you think he should serve life in prison? And I'm like, well, obviously, I'm not an expert on the facts of this case. I mean, I'm not going to try a case in the media. I've learned the hard way how unreliable that can be. But assuming that the facts that we're discussing right now are accurate, my answer is yeah. I, w I would lock his cell. I yeah. have no problem with that. He should die in prison. Well, and, and again, there are sometimes if you use a firearm, if you if you exercise this right, the right to keep and bear arms, then you bear the consequences for making good decisions. The responsibility. And That's the right. responsibility that says, if I make poor decisions here, then I bear the responsibility of that. And and you can say, well, you know, he's an old man, so he's apt to, um, you know, fear, and he's worried about something. Listen, and, and if this guy had kicked his front door in, the, then the facts have changed radically and completely yeah, right now. Uh, I recently had one on my channel of a, a, a guy kicking in the door of his ex-girlfriend uh, and his her dad, mom and dad live there too. And as soon as he kicks the door and dad shot him three yeah. times, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, totally justified. I video, yeah, yeah. Totally justified. Whole different situation. Whole different mm -hmm. situation instead of somebody standing out front. Now, when we go to the one in New York, so this guy is known for, uh, you know, you damn kids stay off right, my lawn, right. uh, having worn no trespassing signs on the front door. They're lost, so they go up his long driveway, turn around when they realize, oh no, we're in the wrong place. And it was at night, was it not? At was night, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes out on his porch. And lights up the car. And shoots the car twice yeah. and, and kills one of the passengers in the car. And, and so now our facts change a little bit because he stepped out on his porch. Right. And every state is different here, okay? So in some states, when you're in the curtilage of your right. home, you have some- Another old English dumb yeah, term, yeah. Some protection there. Other places, no, if you're not actually inside the dwelling, you're in trouble. But, but there is no state where it is reasonable to step out on your porch, see a car in your driveway, and shoot at that car with no further provocation. Right. I was going to say, if the car has guns bristling out of it, and they've yeah. already shot your dog, and they're coming out of the car or something, different situation. But uh, So the facts always matter here. <laughs> they better, right? And they sure should. And so when I get people to ask, well, John, what if, right? Can I shoot someone if? Of course, we always say that's the wrong question. Ask, must I shoot someone? Yeah. Is there something you can think of that would allow me not to have to shoot someone that I haven't thought of yet? Right. I, I like that way of phrasing it, too. Well, yeah. and, and if I, okay, so, so even if I go so far as to say, okay, it's late at night, this guy wants to be left alone, he's a curmudgeon, and he's, you know, the grumpy old man, and he steps out on his front porch with his, you know, Marlin 336 Let's lever action. Let's make it a Garand because that's what that's uh, what okay, Clint, an M1 that's what Garand, Clint would have. Yeah, okay, so. so, yeah, you damn kids get off my lawn, right, uh, with his M1. And, and instead, you know, you see that and you go, okay, wait a minute, that car's there. And I say, get away from my property and get off my property right now. Um, and they they leave and I let them. Well, then we don't probably have any problems. Then whatsoever. we have the the case of the couple in in Larue, Missouri that yeah. went out when when they're in the McCloskeys. The, the McCloskeys, and, and then of course that didn't work out too well either. No. But nothing compared to this. There was no bloodshed. There was no felonies. Right. This is a whole different situation here. You know. It, 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 so to me, this is not there, stand your ground has nothing to do with nope. either one of these unjustified conduct is by its nature unjustified conduct. And the castle doctrine too, I think people overemphasize that as mm -hmm. well. Because again, you've got to sell these concepts to a jury if right. it gets to a prosecution. And the, the fact that, the, that a man's home is his castle and there's this presumption that if somebody breaks in your house that you're in fear for your life, it is a rebuttable presumption. And that's what I think a lot of so, people don't understand. Just because somebody breaks in your house doesn't mean you get to shoot them. It's not a hunting license. You're not going to mount the Girl Scout's head above your mantle. And, and let's define terms, right? So right. some people, you know, the lawyers here, they get they're used to talking in lawyer, not used to talking in English, right? So a presumption says is that, hey, I am going to start by operating on the premise that this is true. Right. That's what a presumption is, right? So I presume that you, if somebody breaks into your house, if they forcibly enter your home, that that, that would put a reasonable person at fear right. of their life. However, I only start with that. And, and if the prosecutor says, hey, wait a minute, I have a strong argument why this should not have been the case, then they can make that argument right. in court. And if they can rebut your argument why you, you know, if they can make a strong enough case that you shouldn't have been in fear, well, then that goes away. For instance, you might say, okay, so, so my front door was closed and this person opened my front door and entered my home. And so I was in fear for my life. 
Well, okay, that's fine until it's an 87-year-old grandma on a walker Correct. who opens the door and then she's, you know, putting her in there and, you know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm locked out of my house. Can right. you help me? And she's you go, off. she's coming right for me. And you shoot her and you kill her. Or the example I would use is the one you mentioned, which is literally a nine-year-old Girl Scout who's an right. aggressive salesperson who Just walks in the door, opens your door and says, you want to buy some cookies? Well, that doesn't mean you get to shoot her. Exactly right. A reasonable person could not be in fear for their life except for, as I always have to point out, my high cholesterol level. Again, yes, too many my, thin mints yeah, in one 24-hour period, but <laughs> that's pretty much of a stretch. So six yeah, boxes of these thin mints, when do they start working? <laughs> exactly. Uh, just yeah. because somebody comes in your house doesn't mean you're in fear for your life. There's a strong likelihood that it does, but it's not an absolute likelihood. And, and uh, again, somebody pulling into your driveway, somebody knocking right. on your door. Guys, there's, there's just got to be a lot more going on here before and, that's going to be And somebody outside your home is, it, again, especially uh, in the case in Kansas City, when you've got a typical suburban home, that you have a driveway and a walk up and your front door is open, not open, but I mean, it is accessible to regular people. It's a normal thing for someone to come up and knock on your door. Right. Now, if you live in a gated you know, home, like you live in a home with big fences and a big gate because you're super wealthy or whatever, and they climb your fence right. to go knock on your door, that's a different story. Yeah. But when they knock on your door, this is a normal, regular thing that people do. And so responding to that with, with bare fear is, is completely inappropriate is unreasonable right. and when the jury finds that unreasonable i, I don't see I, I mean unless his lawyer is the king of all legal theorists i, I don't see anything that's going to make for justification here uh, and again make sure we understand that we understand that we don't know all the facts in this case i mean there perhaps there's something we don't know right I, but but um but from what i'm hearing so far it looks pretty clear cut that Everything you just said is well, and you know, could I see an attorney making an argument? Okay, so what has actually happened here is my my client, uh, his family has been trying to get him into a home for forever because his memory care is bad, and his he's got par advanced Parkinson's, and that's making right. him paranoid. And so, by reason of all of this, he's not accountable for his actions. And so, instead of sending him to prison, we we strip him of his rights to keep and bear arms and send him to a home for full time. Care. And that's you know, and maybe that happens. that may be the only argument, but that's kind of like arguing my client's an alcoholic; it's an illness, and the reason he drove drunk and killed three people is because he couldn't control himself right. because of his illness. Uh, you're still responsible for your actions. Still action. doesn't justify the yeah, exactly actions. Exactly right. So. And, and so, you know, when we say, I say this all the time, everybody I know who is a reasonable person doesn't want kinds of incidents like this to happen. Right. We, we don't. We just don't want these kinds of things to happen. And, and so what we have, the legal system that we have in place is designed to keep these from happening, which is why when something like this does happen, we happen to have two at the same time, which is really rare, it makes the national news. Mm -hmm. It's so rare that it makes the national right. news when it happens. And, and it should make the national news. It should shock our conscience. Right. But that doesn't mean we need to change laws because actually what we have in the vast majority of cases, you think there's four to 500 million firearms in private citizen hands in America. Um, you know, something like 40%-ish of American homes or more have firearms in them. And yet we see these kinds of things happen a couple of times a year. Right. And, and so... Yeah, the, old, the old saying, 499 million guns hurt nobody today. Yeah. So, well, but, but that said, because that sounds like a sort of a self-serving thing that guys that believe in the Second Amendment would sure. say. So that said, how do we address uh, the concerns of the rational and appropriate concern of people that even one of these is too many? How can we make this not happen? I know that you're not a big fan of mandatory training. No. Uh, and, and I know you're a libertarian. You're the definition of a libertarian. And I love that. <laughs> Wackadoo. Um, yeah. And I'm a hypocrite about that, as we've discussed before, because I agree with you 100%. But you have an eclectic view. Of I've had so many people come through my classes over the years that I just want to give them a hug and say, don't own a gun. Yeah. You just don't have the mindset or the capacity for it. So how do we address this, that there's so many guns in the hands of people? And, and perhaps it is a very small fraction. And I believe it is. I believe it is. But those that small fraction of people that simply just shouldn't have guns how do we address that is it training is it regulation what do we do to fix well that? i mean not I, a big fan of, of regulation that's for sure but what do you think my, my personal thought is is that every time we you know when we say there's a misuse here uh i, I agree with you we have the right to keep and bear arms mm -hmm. but just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean you should right i said that we have the right as a as a adult to have children but not everybody should you and I have the right to do, go full Burt Kreischer right now and just take your take, take our shirts, shirts off, off. And do this interview. We will not do it. the internet would just stop. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's legal, but not a good idea. That's yeah. smart. <laughs> it, it's so, you know, sometimes you've got to say, hey, I don't have the decision-making capability to own a firearm, but I want to leave that in their hands. Just like, for instance, you know, uh, I, I'm a religious guy, right? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm a man of faith. I was a pastor for 14 years. And I, I, man, religion hurts people in America every year. Oh. And, and the, the amount of, right? of sex abuse in the church in America today is pretty, 
pretty significant. And so we go, wait a minute, how do we stop this? Well, I certainly don't want to start putting laws on the practice yeah, of religion, of religion right. because of where that's going to lead us. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I mean, our right to free worship is enshrined in the First Amendment for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so, wait a minute now, for punishing misdeeds, I'm all about it. I, I think, listen, when we recognize this misdeed is indeed wrong, and again, you, you convict somebody of murder too, you're talking... I mean, a minimum 10 years. Uh, well, and, and he's 84. And so, he's 84. Yeah. That's a life sentence. It's a life sentence. Yeah, I mean, gonna happen here, yeah. in prison, three years for an 84-year-old's right. a life sentence. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, the penalties for misuse, the penalties for, uh, you know, making these kinds of errors, I think should be stiff. When mm -hmm. you take life and death in your hands, you, you ir irreparably uh, harm someone's life, well, then you should be accountable for that. And we have that. And thereby... We're giving a disincentive to people to do stupid things. Right. I mean, that's how our system's supposed to work. It's right? how it's supposed to work, and, and it and does. Well, and you mentioned freedom of religion. I mean, how about freedom of speech? I mean, people don't talk about that one. Do you think that people bully 12-year-old girls on the Internet to the point where they'll hang themselves? Well, of course that's happened. Or so do we ban the Internet? We, so I think the, the problem with all of these is that in a free society, and thank God we live in a free society, or at least one of the freest in the world, yeah. thank God we do. And since we do, evil people can take advantage of that. Evil people can take advantage of the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment even, and they can exploit the loopholes, yep. they can exploit those freedoms for evil purposes. And I'm, I, I think what you're saying, and I agree, is that if we, if we make it impossible for anybody to enjoy those freedoms to stop the bad apples, right. then we're no longer living in a free society. No, 100%. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, uh, whether you call it the non-aggression principle or live and let live, mm -hmm. this idea that says, listen, my rights end where another person's begins, and, and so... You know, we have existing laws that say, wait a minute, harming someone is a crime. And the more I harm them, the higher level that crime goes. And that is designed to act as a deterrent and also to, to remove from society bad actors. And I think we have that. I think that the system will work that out in this case. Um, and then how do we lessen incidents like this? Well, well listen, if, you go, if we go back again and we say, let's just say we had 10 incidents like this a year in America out of... 340 million uh, right. inhabitants. There's really no reasonable way to decrease that incidence from 0.0001% to below that. Right. It's just yeah, not. Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to count the successes once in a while. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and so from a statistical perspective, it's literally, it's not even a rounding error. Mm -hmm. It's, it's n noise in the signal. And so I think that when we see an incidence like this, we put it out nationwide as a reminder, right. you know? So, so that's, for instance, like, okay, so back in another life, I, I operated a nuclear reactor for the U.S. Navy. And when somebody would, uh, we'd have a broken reactor, somebody would operate it wrong or a part would break or something would go wrong, and all of a sudden we've got a broken hot water maker. And, and so then we fix the hot water maker, and uh, that's all it is, just a hot rock. Hot rock makes hot water, hot water makes steam, steam makes a boca. Uh, it's just a, you know, hot water maker. And so uh, all the people from Hiroshima are taking great comfort with that. Well, no, yeah. not so good there, right? So not a nuclear bomb, but a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor go. is just a hot water heater. There you go. So the hot water heater breaks, um, and we we figure out why, and we write up why, and we send that to every other nuclear reactor in the United States Navy, and we say, hey, we broke our hot water heater. Here's how we broke our hot water heater. So y'all don't break your hot water heater Correct. like me, okay? Right. Uh, and so, again, I think that what we do is remind every single firearms owner in America, like we do on the national mm -hmm. news, and I'm down with it, this is unreasonable behavior. Right. This is not okay. So, so rather than mandate, okay, so the state has to mandate a thing to do a thing, because you, you know like I do, when the state mandates training, it's dumb. Right. It's ridiculous. Anybody and it who's doesn't got, work. It doesn't work. When well, you make somebody do training, it doesn't, it doesn't work. They've got to want to do it. So. Anybody who, who does this, you're a lawyer. You've got, mm -hmm. you got continuing legal education credits, sure. right? And the state-mandated ones mm -hmm. are usually terrible. No, they're awesome. They're awesome. Yeah. I'm delighted <laughs> to do it. You lie, liar <laughs> from liest thing. They're terrible, right? So now, hopefully, if, if the state starts going, hey, you can take any number of things, and we can get other stuff and so oh man i want to study this topic right. and that'll fulfill my legal education yeah. you know continuing legal education stuff great um and and i'm not for mandatory state mandated education because it ends up being garbage yeah. but but again when we say hey everyone here's what the real issue was here it was really poor decision making and a lack of objective reasonable evidence of a deadly threat you can't use deadly force in that instance and so don't act like these guys because i don't care if you're 83 or 87 years old i don't care if you're in your home or standing on your porch if you act in these unreasonable ways um well then you're going to live in a gated community for the rest yeah. of your life and prison food sucks
I just wish our media would take the right tack on this and, and basically echo what you just said, because in fact, I think what we're going to get instead is all gun owners are irresponsible and all guns should be banned and stand your ground should be repealed. And that's the focus is going to be on the wrong issue here. The issue should be, hey, guys, as you said, look at all the people that are doing it right. You know, well, and, and this was an this. egregious error. Absolutely, and we should treat it as such. But again, let's frame that discussion in a way that doesn't paint everybody with the same brush. 100%. And that's, that's the thing that scares me. So. And so, you know, I think that there are some good ones, uh, you know, some good sources in the world. Uh, they're few and far between, uh, but they do exist. And so I think we try to amplify those voices. And rather than retreat to our ideological ghettos, I think that what I encourage Ooh. folks... Uh, Some heavy stuff. Well, I mean, I think we do that. You know, sure. as, as a guy that's, I, I'm a right to keep and bear arms absolutist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm probably more pro Second Amendment than almost anybody I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the, all right, I'll, I'll make everybody mad. I'm the guy that says that if you're a felon, once you've finished up your sentence, if we trust you in the world, we should trust you with the right to keep and bear arms. And if we don't trust you with that, why are you in my society? Yeah, why are you free? Why are you free? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, otherwise, like, uh, you know, so what happens on our side is we tend to, to just gather among our people and, and talk to each other. Yeah, you're right. And we have this mutual admiration right. society. And on the other side, they have their mutual admiration society. Well, we attribute our motives to real goodness and look at how right. good we are and we're right. Well, their motives are because they're evil and they want right. to control us and they hate us. And guess what? They're over here. Yeah, we're good. Everything's great. And they hate us and they want they're to control us. They're getting the exact evil. same propaganda from their side. Um, yeah. So right. what we call that is there's this, this whole system called motive attribution asymmetry. Uh, and that's a big term, yeah. but that mode of attribution asymmetry says my side acts out of good motives, their side acts out of poor motives. And I think we need to do better at that, frankly. I think we need to say, nope, my conclusions are mine because I believe that they stand on right. firm footing. Their motives are, are likely good too. Their right. motives, I mean, there might be a few bad apples over there, like there's a few bad apples over on my side, but, but their motives are good. I just think that they're seeing it wrong. It's like any issue, I think. I, I'm, I'm significantly older than you, but I, you know, I, I, I grew up in the Ronald Reagan era. Mm. I, that's when I became an adult. And it was always wonderful to know that you could be ideologically different from somebody and still have lunch with them and have a conversation about things without it coming to blows or shouts. Right. You, know, you still split the bill at the end of that and give each other a hug when you go to the parking lot. And it seems like that's much more rare now than, I, than it was. And I think that, obviously, with regard to this issue, but uh, obviously a lot of other issues as well. Right. So, yeah. I, uh, uh, Discourse is good. I think that I remember the, I think it was the 1980 presidential debates The uh, was uh, Ronald Reagan versus uh, Bush the Elder in their primary debate. And they're sitting like this, and they're talking, and, and when they ask, oh, you know, uh, Governor Reagan, governor at the time, late 70s, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, what do you think of this? And he goes, you know, well, um, you know, Mr. Bush believes this way, and I really understand why he does, and I see a lot of value there, and I think he's a really good guy. I just see it this other way, and I think we ought to do that. And they get done at the end, and they shake each other's yeah. hands, and, and you're like, man, if we could go back there. Yeah, you, watch, me. you watch those videos, and you long for the past. Yeah. And I think true? we can get back there. Yeah. I really do. You know, I, I, I'll say as kind of a final thing, uh, as, as this has gotten crazy, my wife's grandfather um, came here from Cuba, earned his citizenship in the United States by fighting in Vietnam in the Marine Corps. And um, it was literally a bathtub kid, you know, came, floated over here from Cuba in a boat, in a bathtub. And, and I said, you know, Grandpa, man, it feels like the, the world's going to hell. And, and he said, you know what it feels like, John? It feels like when I came home from Vietnam. Wow. He said, it feels like, uh, it feels like when, I, when I got home from Vietnam in the 60s and it was just turbulent and everybody hated each other and everything was going wrong and we were really wondering if the country was going to make it. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually cooler heads prevailed and we made it. And we yeah. made some real progress in the 60s and things got better. Then it cooled off for a while. He said, so I kind of feel like every 40, 50 years we kind of need to do this. Go through a cycle. And he said, I think we'll make it. And I was like, man, that made me feel so much better. Well, you always want to quote the, the great British actor, Gary Oldman, who was quoting right. Winston Churchill. Because I'm not sure Churchill said it, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but basically, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing the heck out of this, but basically the system that we have is the worst system on the planet Earth, except for except every other system. Except for every other system. And I think exists. that's something people need to keep in mind. Let's have some faith. So. Well, we've solved another problem. Welcome, world. Uh, if you agree with that, send some, uh, send some donations to your favorite charity, and let's make the world a better place. So, Johnny, as always, man, I can't thank yeah. you enough for taking the time to come in. It's always just your font of wisdom, and it's just wonderful to, to hear your opinion on this. I episode. enjoy it, man. Thanks for Appreciate having me on. It. All right. Take care, buddy. And that wraps up another episode of Guns and Gavels. Join us next time to learn more about the legal use of force, personal protection, and firearms training. Show your support and hit the like and subscribe buttons to make sure you never miss an episode. Till next time, stay safe.